Hello everybody and welcome to Metrum Institute's MI210 class, Essentials of Population PKPD. Today uh, our topic is going to be focused on a very practical aspect of modeling and that's the actual coding of the population nonlinear mixed effects models. This is Mark Gastengay again, uh, your instructor, and uh, I'll lead you first through some uh, didactic overview. We'll discuss a few points but we'll spend a lot of time today um, reviewing the hands-on implementation of uh, population nonlinear mixed effects models using the SIMI interface uh, through R and non-MEM. Remember, as always, uh, you can ask questions through the, uh, the question dialog on the GoToWebinar control panel. And, uh, of course, you can follow up through the uh, web discussion. So today I'd like to cover uh, the general ideas of, of how to code pharmacostatistical models through AnimTran, um, but also some specific details on how to, uh, how to write the models, how to interpret the output. We'll go through the, the um, specification of the PREDPP model library for, for population PK models. And then we've got a few practice problems and study guide questions to get us through this topic. So we've discussed the non-MEM system before and it's quite relevant again here in that we're using non-MEM as our prototypical nonlinear mixed effects modeling software. Um, just to remind you, the non-MEM system itself is comprised of multiple components. There's the non-MEM estimation core there are prediction routines, and there's a typo here. This is PREDPP, P-R-E-D, uh, which, which is the um, library of population PK models. And there's NMTRAN, which, which allows us to translate these model predictions and data sets to the NIMEM estimation core. When we write models in NMTRAN for NIMEM, or in, in, in uh, non-MEM without NMTRAM, we have multiple options. Uh, the first, which was uh, available before NMTRAN and PREDPP were created, was to write a user-defined PRED routine in FORTRAN. So this is, uh, this is pure FORTRAN code um, where the users would have to write the model predictions, uh, the relations between the parameters and random effects, as well as supplying partial derivatives of the um, model prediction with respect to all of the estimated parameters. Remember that NAMM uses a gradient-based method. That's why we need these partial derivatives. Well, that's quite a tedious job, and uh, you know that was the case um, in, for all models back in the early days with NAMM. Uh, that's uh, you know the late 1980s. Um, and, and there were certain cases where you'd need to write a Fortran routine uh, even uh, as non-MEM evolved, but uh, now the NMTRAN, PREDPP, uh, and, and DollarPred interface uh, has quite a lot of functionality and it's, and it's very rare that users will have to write their own Fortran routine. So what we'll use is NMTRAN either with DollarPred model specifications or PREDPP models. Dollar pred is uh, is just a very simple algebraic specification of the model and all of the relationships between fixed and random effects parameters and any predictor variables. Uh, there's no data data preprocessing or model library available with dollar pred. We don't have the luxury of uh, using things like uh, additional dosing, interdose intervals, steady state, and so on. But um, it's a fairly straightforward uh, implementation. And we don't have uh, any, any um, predefined model library subroutines, such as a uh, two-compartment model with first-order absorption, for example. One thing we do get, though, is, is an automatic uh, specification of the partial derivatives for each of the parameters. And this is done behind the scenes. The user doesn't have to worry about this. But this is a nice feature that the NMTRAN uh, front end uh, delivers uh, even if you're just doing a simple dollar pred model. If we're doing pred PP, now we have uh, access to all of the data preprocessing commands, um, the um, 
model libraries for, for one, two, and three compartment models, um, and uh, differential equation models and so on. We'll, we'll, we'll go through that in a few minutes. But you really have uh, all of the functions available to you now, um, including then the automatic generation of partial derivatives. I see there's a comment about the micron volume here. I'm going to try to adjust that uh, on the fly here and see if that helps. It may be... Um, well, I've got it maxed out on this end. Um, if, it's, if your volume is not working well, I'd suggest using headphones uh, if, if, you're, if you're not. Okay, back to the lecture. Um, We'll talk about NMTRAN control streams, and this is how we're going to create uh, the model code. Um, also, um, the way that we communicate uh, the model and, and the data set contents. We talked about that uh, a couple weeks ago um, to the estimation core. NMTRAN control streams are ASCII text files. That's plain old text. Um, can be read in a variety of uh, software programs. It's probably the most basic way to represent uh, content in a file. Um, a text editor such as Notepad, although that's a pretty weak one. Um, on the Windows side, something more like uh, WordPad or WinEdit, uh, some of these other, uh, and, and there are you know, several of these available. Um, those, are, those are probably better than, than Notepad. Um, there are also some rules. We can't use tabs in a control stream. So you need to use spaces if you want to align code. Uh, we, except for file names and comments, uh, we, we must use all uppercase letters in the control streams. There's a line length limit um, in the control stream. If you exceed that line length limit, uh, the code will be clipped at 80 characters. And there's also a comment indicator, which is a semicolon. Uh, which will comment out anything to the right of the semicolon. It can be at the beginning of the line, end of the line, wherever it is, anything to the right-hand side of the semicolon will be ignored. Okay. So we'll, we'll get some experience writing control streams in, in a few minutes. Let's start first talking about the components of a dollar pred model. This is a simple NMTRAN control stream, but it's quite useful. And we'll use this to illustrate some of the basics in building population nonlinear mixed effects models before we confuse things and get a little more complicated with the PREDPP libraries. So with dollar $PRED, we have a simple NMTRAN control stream. The code must define the link between the independent variables and the dependent variable. There is no prior assumed uh, knowledge of, uh, of a prediction variable name in this. Uh, it, it, it's mapped by the user, uh, unlike the PREPP routines, which are uh, specifically designed to deliver a prediction of a particular compartment concentration. Um, the dollar pred models are, are just a very flexible um, model specification language. There are some required control stream records, and you'll notice that all of these records begin with a dollar sign. These, these are the, the headers of each of the blocks. There's a dollar problem, input, data, dollar pred, uh, theta, omega, sigma, and estimation. These are the required ones. Uh, you might add a few others to, to include uh, a few additional features. Um, what I'm going to do now is, is walk you through uh, each of these um, and provide some guidance at least some basics. Um, I also suggest that you look at the NAMM7 help files on these and we'll, we'll take a quick look at that uh, using the help tool in the SIMI interface. Let's start with dollar problem. This is very simple. It's, it's, and, and by the way, all of these um, control structures can be abbreviated by the first three letters of the word. So dollar prob could be dollar pro well, most of the time we, we call it dollar prob uh, input data these can all be abbreviated um, but you need at least the first three letters of each the problem specification can be listed here and this is completely up to the user to define so it's just a description a text it's a short character string uh, this is not used at all by um, non-mem 
in any part of the estimation. It's really just a label. And you'll see this label is, is, is tacked on to your uh, model output at the end. It's sometimes a useful thing for users to uh, describe the model, although the character length limit is, is kind of short here. Um, and uh, if, you, if you try to extract this programmatically, yeah, you might end up with a, a very brief uh, description of the model. But in any case, it's a good idea for each run to, to put some specific uh, label. So the way you do that is dollar prob or dollar problem, uh, and then some, some string of text. This text is not model code, it's just a comment. Uh, it is read in by NMTran, but uh, for their, therefore it, it, uh, it doesn't follow the rules of, of the rest of the model code uh, in that uh, an uppercase um, requirement is, is not necessary here. So you, have, you can mix lower and uppercase um, numbers and, uh, and letters here. It's really just descriptive. Uh, there's not a, a set defined order to, to the control stream structures, although I've, I've laid them out in, in, in an order that's commonly used and one that makes sense. Um, probably useful to follow this, but you'll see if you look at other examples, there may be different uh, preferences in how the model structure is, um, or the control structures are ordered in the control stream. Uh, it, there's no uh, mandatory order, it's just uh, personal preference. Dollar input and dollar data, we've already talked about these. These define the, the data set contents. For example, dollar input defines the um, items in the data set and, and actually assigns the NMTRAN data values to each of the columns in the data set. In this example, we have a comment column, an ID, a time, amount, dependent variable, and then a couple of covariates, age and weight. Dollar data defines the name of the data set and any file reading options. Uh, here we have an example where the data set is called 123.csv. This is a file uh, in the directory that, uh, that the current model file is located. Uh, you can also include file paths or relative paths here in specifying the data name. Um, there's an option here to read to ignore any rows that begin with a, with a C. So if you have a comment indicator, you might have a header row, you might have a um, uh, listing of, of a certain number of records uh, that, that are commented out with, with a C in the first column, and they'll be ignored when the data set's read in. These are just a couple of the options for dollar data. Next we have a um, dollar pred record, and I'll get into more detail on dollar pred when we look at a specific example, but this is where you write the model code. This, this defines the, the algebraic expression relating the dependent variable to the predictors, and it also is a place where we define the fixed and random effect parameters. Well, if you recall from the very first lecture, we said that uh, one of the things that we're doing when we're building models or, or the process involves making an observation. Um, proposing some model structure for that. So we've done that in dollar pred. We've uh, observed the data, in dollar data, in dollar input. And now we need to set some initial estimates for the parameters of that model. And so we divide the initial estimates into different sections uh, depending upon fixed or random effects and, and the hierarchy in the random effects. The first of these is dollar theta, and this is where we specify the initial estimates for the fixed effects parameters. Fixed effects parameters are those structural model parameters such as uh, clearance and volume in a PK model, or they might be the coefficient of a covariate effect. Any one of these uh, is specified under dollar theta. And the syntax for specifying these is um, available in three different uh, variations. The first is where we might specify lower and upper bounds. So you use parentheses and specify a lower bound, an initial estimate, and an upper bound all separated by commas and that allows us to specify bounds on the search for a parameter. Uh, the next one allows us to set a, a lower bound and an initial estimate and so if you put two elements that's all you're going to get and if you just put a single element all you get is the initial estimate 
Now remember when we did the um, nonlinear regression tool in, in Excel, we talked about uh, setting bounds. Um, remember the solver that we used allowed us to specify constraints. It's a, as a rule of thumb, you should only specify constraints where there is a physiologic or a physical chemical reason or, or some structural reason related to the, the model domain for putting a boundary on the parameter. Um, it's not uh, sufficient or it's not a good idea to arbitrarily set bounds on a parameter that should otherwise extend you know potentially to plus or minus infinity. Uh, bounds are, are really only there to set physical limits on a particular parameter. Th it's not possible to specify a case where there's no lower bound but only an upper bound. Um, if it's only a single bound, it's going to be lower and initial. If you want an upper bound uh, and, and no lower bound, well, you might set some, some very small negative number um, as the lower bound. <clears throat> so here's an example. Three fixed effects parameters here listed, one with a lower bound, one with no bounds, and one with both upper and lower bounds. So maybe our first is uh, our estimate for clearance, 20 liters per hour. We know that clearance can't go negative, so we'll bound it at the low end by zero. Maybe the second is, is the estimate of um, a covariate effect in a power model. So the covariate effect in a power model uh, does not require bounds. And so we, we might specify that with no lower or upper bounds, as indicated by the second term. And maybe the third represents something like um, the absolute bioavailability estimate uh, if we had a... Um, an IV reference and an oral test treatment. We know in that case that absolute bioavailability has to be between 0 and 1, and so we would constrain that, maybe giving an initial estimate of 0.5. So those are just a few scenarios. You can imagine all kinds of rationale for uh, why you'd set bounds and what bounds you'd use, but, but that's an example of, of using those boundaries. You can also fix an element in theta by using the word fix or fixed with an ED. Um, the, this just simply takes that fixed effect parameter and fixes it to whatever value you've assigned. And here I've set it to a value of zero. This is a common thing we'll do sometimes to, to examine the effect of fixing a parameter to its null value if the value zero is equivalent to its null. Um, but you could also set a fixed value of theta to some known uh, parameter estimate uh, if, if you so desire. So that's where we specify the fixed effects parameters. I'll just pause for a moment to look at questions here. Okay. Uh, now we'll specify the inter-individual random effects. The initial estimates for the inter-individual random effects um, covariance matrix. And that's specified in dollar omega. Remember, that's the name of the matrix. The covariance matrix of the inter-individual inter random effects is called omega. <clears throat> we can specify omega as a diagonal form uh, where we specify only the variance terms or a block form which includes the off-diagonal elements. There are no bounds on the estimation of omega uh, that are specified by the user, at least. However, there are some internal constraints uh, already programmed into NIMEM to make sure that the matrix is a positive definite matrix, which is a requirement uh, for the omega matrix. In other words, uh, the, the variance can't go negative. If we fix an element of omega, it actually fixes the entire block. Uh, it doesn't fix just a single element. So here's some examples. Here's a diagonal covariance matrix for the random effects on clearance and volume. So we have a, a two-parameter um, structural model and or at least only two of those parameters uh, are being modeled with inter-individual random effects. So we specify dollar omega and then the two elements of the diagonal matrix. So uh, we're only concerned with the variance terms here. So 0 0.04 is the variance of, of the random effects for clearance. 0 0.09 is the variance of the random effects for volume. And in fact, if we assume that this was a um, proportional uh, excuse me, a proportional inter-individual variance model, then the, um, these estimates here 
<clears throat> would be equivalent to uh, a square, a excuse me, a coefficient of variation of 20% and 30%. Remember the um, coefficient of variation in a proportional model is equal to the variant, the square root of variance times 100. We could also imagine modeling the full block relationship between the random effects and clearance and volume. And to specify that, we use the term block here. Um, you'll notice on the, on the diagonal example, we didn't specify diagonal or block, and that's because diagonal is the default. You could write the word diagonal if you'd like, but omitting it does the same thing. Uh, omega block here specifies is that we have a block matrix with off diagonals included and then the index here 2 specifies that we have a diagonal length of 2 for this block and so it's specified now in order uh, row major order here so we have uh, 1 1 2 1 and 2 2 uh, where the variance for clearance is 0.04 the variance for volume random effects is 0.09 and the inter-individual covariance between these two is, is some value, an initial estimate of 0.01. So now we're estimating that off-diagonal term. It's also possible to make combinations of the two. Let's say we had four uh, random effect parameters in our model, one for Ka, uh, lag time, clearance and volume. And the first two were being estimated as a diagonal, but we wanted the block estimation for the last two. Well, we can mix this, and we could, we could specify omega in two steps here. So dollar omega for the first two would be the diagonal pieces, and then dollar omega block for the next two would show the covariance between clearance and volume. So this statement here in this series of statements uh, specifies initial estimates for the four variances as well as the covariance between clearance and volume. So we can have mixtures of blocks. Um, the ordering of these elements it relates to the order in which we identify the individual random effects in the control stream. And I'll show you that later, but, but the, they're listed in terms of 1, 1, 2, 2, this would be 3, 3, and 4, 4, where this off diagonal term here would be uh, the row four column three value. Okay, sigma is specified in the same way as, as we uh, would specify omega. It can be diagonal or block. Remember, most of the time we're not dealing with the covariance of the residual random effects. That's really only used when you have a multivariate endpoint. Um, but I'll show you an example. So we might specify sigma as a, as a single variance term. Let's say we had just one residual error term. And so we'd specify dollar sigma and some variance estimate. 0.04 here probably refers to a proportional model, which would be equivalent to a 20% uh, CV. <clears throat> If we wanted to model the correlation in the residual error between um, two multivariate endpoints, we might use a block in sigma where, for example, the first term might be the residual variance for the parent drug and the second uh, variance might be the residual variance for the metabolite. And since they're both taken from the same plasma sample, we might model the correlation in that residual error. This also requires the use of the L2 data item indicator, which we talked about uh, a few weeks ago. Um, we'll we'll um, get into this in more detail in the, in the next course. Okay. So we've done um, all of the basics now. We've specified the data. We've specified a model and how, how the predictors relate to that data. And we have initial estimates for all of the model parameters. Next, we have to define the estimation options. This is where we specify the types of objective functions to be used and various options for estimation. Uh, there are several options on this, and uh, when I get through these few, we'll look at the help file just to review some. Uh, but there's lots of options, and particularly in non-MEM7, there are even more now. Um, 
let's go through some of the basics. So essentially what we want to do is, is specify, specify the estimation uh, method. That's the most important thing. And then potentially the name of a model specification file. We'll talk about that later. Uh, or uh, other options. So here's an example where we might want to run the first order method, FO method, with map Bayes estimation, also known as the post hoc, to get the individual parameters. Remember, first order estimation by itself only gives us population level parameters. There are no individual estimates obtained under FO. So we have to run that second map Bayes step, which is done after the population estimates are obtained, uh, if we want individual ADA estimates. And here's how you'd specify that, dollar $est or dollar estimation. Max eval zero, actually this is actually done under first order with known parameters. So max eval zero means that we, we already have the final population estimates and we're gonna run the postdoc step to get the individual estimates. Max eval is a parameter that defines the number of function evaluations that are allowed in the parameter search. If we set it to zero, that means we're not going to do any search on the parameters. We're going to make a prediction at the population parameters as they are. But the post hoc option here does allow us to do the estimation step on the individual parameters. This is map based estimation. It's not a population estimation, uh, but uh, it does allow us to estimate the individual random effects. <clears throat> The next one here allows us to do conditional estimation with interaction. And so we're specifying max eval equal to 9,999. That just happens to be the maximum number of function evaluations allowed in a single parameter search. Uh, that means you know, we're, we're, we want to estimate the parameters. We're not going to stop the search. Um, method one indicates conditional estimation and interaction specifies the eta epsilon interaction that we discussed way back in the first lecture. So this allows us now to do conditional estimation with eta epsilon interaction. Remember that was used in only in cases where the residual variance model included a model prediction as part of the weighting function. Uh, so a proportional model, an exponential model, for example, we would, uh, would qualify for the interaction. If it was purely an additive model, interaction is not necessary. So this is how we'd specify method one, or FOCE with interaction. Um, we can also change the number of sig significant digits required in the final estimates. Remember the termination criteria for non-MEM are based on stability in the parameter estimates. And so if uh, we set sig dig equal to two, um, that would require us to well, we'd be looking to converge after all of the parameters were stable in at least two significant digits. The default for that is three, but there may be some cases where you don't need that precision and, and uh, the higher precision is problematic um, from a numerical point of view. So you might back off and say, okay, you know, two significant digits is all I really need here and, and, I'll, and I'll use that as my termination criteria. There's also a criterion here for printing ten print equal 10, that just defines how frequently the iterations will be printed to the screen and to the output, every 10 iterations in this case. And there's a model specification file here, it got clipped on this line, but model specification file uh, equal to some number dot msf. This is a file in which the modeling results are captured and it allows us to pick up the model run in a subsequent run from where we left off. It's a very handy thing and, and uh, probably should be used on all, on all um, models. We'll discuss how to implement that and, and to pick up that run from the model specification file a little bit later. <clears throat> Dollar table. This is not required, but it's, it's awfully useful if you want to do some plotting afterwards or to look at the difference between the observed and predicted values. So this specifies the options and the file name for your output table. You can have more than one table per problem. Um, in non-MEM7, there are more options now. Um, but the basic syntax is the same. You have dollar table. We, if we say no print, that means it's not going to be printed in the output file it will be sent to a separate file. So that's usually what we choose here. It'll, we'll name the file 
to receive the table output. And we'll usually specify one header. In the old days when we used to use a lot of paper printouts, uh, the, the output was, was specified to give headers at the top of each page. Uh, but now that we're processing table files using electronic methods, we just want a header at the top. And then you specify the, um, the, the table items that you'd like, ID, time, individual prediction, clearance volume, etc., whatever you'd like. There are some variations on the theme here. Uh, we could specify a table that only has the first record per individual, and that's this first only option. So if you just wanted a listing of individual parameters, you might use this one. Uh, so you don't have a, a, a complete listing of all the data. Remember that the table output follows the structure of the data input. The same number of rows will be there. And, um, and so if you don't want all those repeated records, you could use the first only option, which will only give you a single line per individual. And that's useful if you want to create a table of individual parameter estimates. Again, lots of options on these. I'll let you go to the help file to look at all of them. It would be uh, uh, a bit monotonous if I went through all of that right now just want to give you an idea of some of the common features. Okay, so those are the the basic elements of a dollar pred control stream and those that you would probably want to include. Table is optional there, but you're going to want to include the table. Here's what the whole thing would look like if you put it together. We have a problem statement. We'll call this the Emacs model. We have an input statement, just three columns here, ID, DV, and concentration. A data set, which is called pddata.csv. And we're going to ignore anything that begins with a C in that data set. And then we specify the model under $pred. So let's take a few minutes to look at the model specification here. The model we're postulating here is an Emacs model, which has at least two parameters, uh, a maximum effect, an EC50, which is a concentration uh, that achieves half of maximal effect. And sometimes we'll have an intercept or an E0 parameter, but in this case we're assuming that at zero concentration the effect is zero. Emacs is defined now in terms of a fixed effect, theta, one, and an inter-individual random effect, eta1. So the way to look at this is that we've got uh, a, a parameter described by a fixed effect with an exponential inter-individual random effect. Or in other words, Emax is log normally distributed in the population. EC50 has a similar structure, a fixed effect and, a and an exponential inter-individual random effect. What this does, in effect, is it allows us to constrain the individual estimates of Emax and EC50 to be positive. There's no way that this expression here, no matter how uh, small or large uh, eta 1 gets, or eta 2, um, this EC50 will always be positive as long as the theta itself is positive. So that's a useful parameterization for those kinds of model parameters that need to remain positive. Now, you don't always have to have both the fixed and the random effect components. Sometimes we'll simplify the model and just estimate the population fixed effect parameter. But uh, for this model, we're trying to do both, estimate the fixed effect and the inter-individual random effect. None of these, are, none of these um, labels here, Emax and EC50, for example, are recognized by non-MEM or NMTRAN, but the values theta and eta are recognized. We're going to specify a variable for the prediction here called E, short for effect. Uh, and that's a simple Emax model where we have Emax times concentration divided by EC50 plus concentration. That's the simple Emax model. We're just writing it out algebraically here. The usual order of operations follow in Fortran. Multiplication uh, before end, end division before addition. So that's why we need to uh, separate the sum here in, in the denominator through the parentheses. 
E is not recognized by non-mem, but the users defined it here. And what is recognized is the, is the variable Y. Y is viewed as the data. In other words, Y is the link back to the DV column in the data set. So Y and DV are linked. And anything on the right-hand side of Y equals is the model prediction. So it's a user-predicted model here. Y is equal to E, in effect, plus epsilon. Well, epsilon is the residual random effect. There's only one residual random effect in this model. Um, and uh, we're assuming it enters the model in an additive way, as denoted by the additive structure. So y equals, epsilon, equals effect plus some residual error, epsilon. So that's all, all there is to it. We specified the model structure, the relationship between the fixed effects and the structural model parameters, as well as the inter-individual random effects. Once that's all accounted for, we then describe the way that the residual random effect enters the model. That's the model structure. If we um, want to then provide initial estimates, if we're going to do estimation that's required, we need to, to specify them. Here we're going to set boundaries for Emacs and EC50, a lower bound of 0, and an initial estimate of 120 for Emacs and EC50 respectively. And you see here, I've got a comment in the code, it's a semicolon, just identifying the parameters. We're specifying a diagonal random effects matrix, so only the, the variances are being estimated and an additive residual variance uh, with a variance of 9, uh, which would mean square root of 9, 3 is the standard deviation of this additive constant residual variance. Estimation is specified here. We're going to use the default method. If we don't specify a method, that's the FO method. We're going to do full estimation and we're going to print the iteration results every 10. And we're going to table out a couple of items here. Note that uh, you always get uh, DV pred residuals and weighted residuals automatically appended to your table uh, unless you use the no append option. Um, and so you don't have to write those in there. You just need to identify the other items that you might use for plotting or for categorizing the predictions and so on. We didn't specify a table file, so this table is going to be printed right into the output but we would usually use the no print and then file equals option to define the name of the table file. But there you have it. There's your first uh, nonlinear mixed effects model. Uh, it, uh, it differs in structure from the naive pool models that we were playing around with in the early parts of the class um, because now we've got the full hierarchy. We have inter-individual random effects and residual random effects. Uh, we're estimating all of the the variance parameters simultaneously are under FO, we're estimating the thetas, the omegas, and the sigmas. We're not estimating the individual random effects, etas here. And you'll notice there's no postdoc indicated on the estimation line. No postdoc listed there, so we're not going to get individual estimates of the etas in this case. Okay, so I'm going to pause here and answer a, a question or two. Let's see here, this one. If we had to fit an Emacs model to count data. Um, yeah, that's a different question now. So you're looking at uh, a non-continuous endpoint. Uh, the question is, would we specify that the count data follow a negative binomial distribution where we would write out the likelihood function in estimation? Yeah, this is an advanced question here, but it's correct. Um, we can use... Um, dollar pred to specify models uh, for quantities that are not assumed to be normally distributed. Remember continuous data here we're assuming a normally distributed residual. We can also specify uh, predictions for other distributions of the data and count data and we might assume a Poisson or a negative binomial um, to specify the counts model and, we, and we'd have to write out the likelihood function there for that. So I'm not going to confuse the rest of the class with, with that at this point. We do talk about uh, the um, uh, non-continuous type endpoints in, in the subsequent courses at Metrum Institute. 
but you're right in, in that uh, you would use uh, dollar pred to specify the likelihood and then there's an option to relate that likelihood function to uh, uh, the estimation step. <clears throat> Okay, interpreting model output. Well, before we do this, I'm going to just uh, point out the help files and where you can get information on some of these data items we just discussed. So I'm going to go to the uh, to the SIMI interface here. You all should have access to this, and I'm going to choose the help topic here, the non-mem help topic. Um, when you're working in SIMI, if you use the control key and click, you'll you'll open that particular, oh, depending upon your browser, I guess, but you'll open that in a, in a separate tab, and that's helpful. And here's the non-mem7 help. Let's say we wanted to look at some of the options for table. You can look under T for table, or we could look at NMTRAN control records here, which is a summary of them. That's probably a quicker way to get there, and we'll just choose dollar table. Let me expand this a little bit. So this is where I suggest that you look to learn more about all of these options. Uh, there's no way that uh, we'll cover all of the options in the course. Uh, but the, the usage here is defined. Dollar table is a control block. And then there's all of these different options. List, uh, samples, uh, print, no print, file name. And each one of these options here is defined below. There's an example, a very simple example here. Uh, but you, you can look at all of the different options here for output. And this is where uh, non-mem7 is very handy. I chose table intentionally because remember we talked about uh, how non-mem6 and earlier did not calculate the weighted residuals uh, according to the conditional estimation assumptions. Well, non-mem7 does that now. And you can, you can have all kinds of different residuals calculated and they're defined here in dollar table. Um, you see here that there's uh, uh, NPRED, NRES, NWRES. These are assuming non-conditional estimation, no A to epsilon interaction. This is just like they were, they're called NPRED, NRES, and NWRES now, uh, but this is the PRED residuals and weighted residuals of non-MEM6 and earlier. Uh, remember I, I, I demonstrated that uh, uh, we have to do some extensive calculations to get to the conditional weighted residuals uh, that's only true for non-MEM6 and earlier. Non-MEM7, now we can get things like conditional weighted residuals, which are calculated according to conditional estimation uh, with no eta epsilon interaction or with uh, eta epsilon interaction, and so that's a CW res I. So you can call specifically for any of these in the table. Um, it, it, Non-MEM7 is also smart in that if you use a particular estimation method, you'll get the appropriate residual uh, under the, the um, residual heading. There's a bunch of other options here. We can have, we can have ADA items labeled in the tables um, and so on. The reserve pieces for the comments here, they, these are not uh, uh, so useful, um, particularly with non-MEM7. And there's, there's a further description of how each of these elements can be treated. So the help files are quite extensive. Um, that's how you'd look for help on dollar table. Let's look at dollar estimation. There's another one. Dollar estimation. Uh, in 9MM7, lots more options now. Um, we talked about the, the classic methods so far. First order, first order conditional estimation, Laplacian, with and without interaction the post hoc method, we've talked about all of those, um, but there are other options here. Oh, and by the way, um, to answer uh, Francois's question about um, a um, non-continuous data, you'd use this likelihood or minus two log likelihood option to relate uh, your um, probability density function to a likelihood. Um, but there's all kinds of options here, uh, including uh, a variety of, of estimation methods. We'll cover some of these later in the course. I didn't want to get too heavy with the statistics, and we're going to just deal with the classic methods for now. But here we go with um, method equals zero. That's FO. One is conditional. 
and hybrid is one that I mentioned before where you could you could uh, allow um, different estimation methods conditional or FO type methods within the same model uh, just to save some compute time and then there's a bunch more there's iterative two stage there's Monte Carlo importance sampling there's uh, important samplings with uh, map estimation stochastic approximation for EM uh, all kinds of methods, including a full MCMC Bayesian method. Uh, we're not going to discuss those at this point. We'll, we'll, we'll ca catch that later in the course. But that's where you specify these, is in the estimation step. So going back to where we started, this is the help system, and it's a good place to learn more about the control records. There's also a bunch of um, example files. Um, under examples and you can find um, control streams here uh, for a variety of, uh, of models. Um, they've added quite a few of these in NonMem 7 but you'll see that most of them are pretty similar to what we just talked about. Let me see if I can find one that is uh, a dollar pred. I think control 3 might be. No, that's a pred pp. In any case, you, you can look through these and, ex and explore um, some of these examples. There's also a wealth of examples in the NM users archive, and, and then, of course, we're giving you several examples in this course, too. Okay, one more question. Uh, why max eval 9999 but not zero? Yeah, so that's, that's an indicator. Let me go back to the notes. In estimation, MaxEval defines how many function evaluations are going to be conducted during the parameter search. If we want to just make a prediction at the population parameters, we'd set MaxEval equal to zero. In that case, we're saying we know the parameter estimates, we just want to make a prediction. If we set it to the maximum here, 9,999, that means we want the, the uh, iterative search to proceed. And so we're allowing uh, this just happens to be the cap on the number of function evaluations. In very complex models, you might exceed the cap, and you can always pick up from where you left off in a subsequent run. Uh, but this just uh, simply tells us that we want to do full estimation. We're not making a prediction at the, at the initial estimates. We want to optimize those initial estimates. Okay? All right. So I'll talk a little bit about how to interpret the modeling output, and then we'll go to an example, and we'll, and we'll see all of this stuff in real time. But uh, it might be useful to, to first review what we're going to be looking for. The NAMM output file is very useful. First of all, it, it starts by uh, reiterating what you asked the program to do. So it reviews the model structure, the estimation options, everything that you specified in the control stream. After that, it lists the monitoring of search where we um, look for, th this, this includes information about uh, the gradients during the search, uh, the, the changing objective function value, and changes in the parameters. It also tells us if, if the uh, search was, was successfully minimized uh, and if it rounded out due to, uh, to numerical difficulties, then uh, what were the significant digits in each parameter? That can be useful in identifying problematic parameters. It also helps us to define uh, whether or not any parameters, and there's a warning message sometimes you'll see uh, if a parameter hit a boundary, uh, which is not a good thing. You don't want a parameter running up against a boundary. Um, if it's an artificial boundary. There's the eta bar diagnostic, which we talked about earlier. That's the mean of the individual etas. Remember, our assumption in the parametric method is that that's equal to zero. The minimum value of the objective function, which is useless by itself, but when we compare um, across models within the same estimation method. And then um, the parameter estimates themselves are, are quite informative. Are they realistic, as well as the standard errors of those estimates um, uh, defining some some precision around the parameters. Um, so interpreting the results, uh, oftentimes we, we don't use the parameter estimates themselves. We derive a quantity that makes it a little more useful to understand. 
and the way we the the, the um, approximations we'll use here is for proportional and you can also do for exponential variance models up to up to a point um, uh, the the inter individual or residual variability can be viewed as a coefficient of variation and the way we get that is that the the reported variance either the initial estimate we supply or the final estimate uh, is reported as a variance the diagonal element in the uh, in the um, covariance matrix take the square root of that times 100 that gives us a, a percent CV percent coefficient of variation and this is a common way to think about variability between individuals yeah this is a 30 percent CV in clearance for example uh, or even in a uh, assay variability that there is a 12% um, a CV uh, uh, in, in intraday variability in that in that uh, assay, you know, some, something like that. It, it, it denotes that there is a heteroscedastic component to the variability. It's not a constant variability. It actually increases according to a constant coefficient of variation, but the variability is higher at the high end of the scale than it is at the low end. This is uh, directly uh, an implementation of that heteroscedasticity uh, concept that we discussed earlier in the course. If you have a constant variability model, then we might model that as an additive error. And so for an additive variance model, then the standard deviation is just directly calculated as the square root of the variance. So this is how we often think about proportional or additive variance terms, and we often report them this way. We might even be thinking about those numbers initially, and you need to make this transformation if you're going to uh, uh, supply a, a useful initial estimate. We also want to um, consider the output and the correlation of eta. So remember we talked about uh, uh, the way we might model this correlation through a block omega. But this is an important um, plot to create when we're interpreting the results as well. Here's a pairs plot defining the correlation in random effects. Um, and uh, it shows us there's some pretty strong relationships between A to 1 and A to 2, even A to 3 here. Maybe not so much with A to 4. Um, so we, in seeing this sort of a plot, we want to make sure that we're capturing that behavior in the way that we specify the inter-individual covariance matrix. It's not a diagnostic of the matrix. It's really just more uh, an image, a picture of what the pattern looks like, and then we want to make sure that we're matching that pattern with the way we've defined the model. The, um, this sort of plot will, will be evident uh, no matter how you structure the covariance matrix. Um, these are estimated values, so that correlation is, 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 is going to be there whether or not we modeled it as a diagonal or as a block. The point is, is that if, if this correlation exists, we want to make the implementation of our model consistent with that. And so a useful way to interpret that is to calculate a correlation coefficient. And here's how you do that. You take the covariance between two of the terms divided by the square roots of the variances. The correlation coefficient ranges from negative 1 to positive 1. The closer it is to an absolute value of 1, the higher the correlation. And um, this can be indicative sometimes of unidentifiable parameters at the individual level, particularly when this approaches you know, value, absolute value of 0.95 or higher. <clears throat> and remember, Distribution of our random effects is also uh, part of the assumption checking that we need to do in interpreting the results. We can look at the eta bar, but then we can also look at the distributions because eta bar tells us where they're centered. It doesn't tell us if the shape is normally distributed. Uh, you can only determine the shape through, through graphics or, or maybe some uh, distribution statistical test. Other parts of the output we'll look at is an MM table file. This is useful to import into graphics to create plots. We can list individual parameters and predictions. We can plot the distributions of the aids. That we get that through the table file. So I'll show you how to do that. Individual estimates are obtained for all methods uh, except for FO and the zero elements of hybrid. 
uh, but we can run the postdoc step there. In order to get the individual estimates, though, we need to define a variable in the control stream. So here's the syntax for that in the control stream. And a dollar pred model will define something like this, dollar pred, and we'll define all the parameters. This is abbreviated intentionally. But we end up with some prediction here, y equals effect plus epsilon. Well, we can also define a variable i pred, which is, which is not understood by non-men, but it's so commonly used uh, that people might think it's recognized. This is a user-defined variable, but ipred um, in this example is going to reflect individual specific prediction uh, of effect. In other words, any inter-individual inter random effects used in, in the determination of the effect prediction uh, will be included in this variable ipred. We can put it into a table and then we can plot individual predictions. Effect is not uh, recognized by non-mem in any way. In PrepPP, however, there is a recognized variable. In PrepPP, we're using this subroutine of, uh, of models. And the prediction of those subroutines is stored in a variable called f. f is a, is a reserved variable in PrepPP. It's understood by non-mem. And it, this is the place where the prediction is stored. And so if we simply specify in, in what you'll see later as the error block, we specify i pred equals f, now we can capture that individual prediction assuming we've done some sort of estimation method that includes estimation of the individual random effects. So basically anything except for the zero elements of a hybrid or FO. Okay. Model specification file is something we're going to use uh, over and over again, and I'll remind you of what this is. This is a, a file. It's actually a binary file that's saved uh, along the process of the, of the modeling. Um, optimization. It's um, useful in case there's an early termination for whatever reason, uh, somebody pulls the plug on your computer, you have a crash, uh, or maybe you exceed the number of maximum evaluations, um, or maybe you run the model and you've forgotten to, to, to create a table or you've omitted something from the table. Instead of going back and rerunning the entire model, which can be a quite lengthy process in some cases, you know, hours, maybe even days for some models. Um, you don't want to have to re redo all of that work. So you can capture the status of the run in a model specification file. And so the way we do that is we specify an estimation, the name of the file to capture the output. It's called a MSFO, Model Specification Output, or you could just abbreviate it to Model Specification File, uh, MSF. Um, but that model specification file output is a file that will be used to capture the binary representation of the model search at that point, at, at, at continuous points over time, and, and wherever the model is terminated. To use that in a future run, then we specify a new control stream block called $MSFI model specification file input, and then we just give it the name of the file. So this would be used in a subsequent run. It's not the same run as where we've defined this up above here. It's in a, in a future run. And then we just pick up from where we left off there. Let's say in this case here, it looks like we might have wanted to run uh, FO, but we forgot to run the post hoc step. So we can use model specification file input from run 001, run max eval 0, and run the post hoc step now. You could do the same thing to run a new table step, uh, a new covariance step, which we'll talk about later. Um, any one of these subsequent steps uh, you could run from the model specification file. So this is a very handy thing. You should get into the habit of using it all the time. Uh, always specify a model specification file output or an MSF file. You may never use it, but uh, it's, it, there's not much of a computational burden to do so. And if you need it, it's very handy to have. The covariance step, dollar covariance, this is another control stream block that specifies that we want to obtain standard errors of the estimates. These are asymptotic standard errors uh, based on asymptotic normal theory um, for a multivariate normal covariance matrix of the estimates. Uh, that's a lot of statistical mumbo jumbo, but what it means is that if we run this, we can, we can, we can given uh, the gradient-based methods here, we can obtain standard errors of the parameters. 
you, this is a, sec, a second step. It's done after estimation. It requires a successful minimization, um, and it can be run. Although in NonMem7, there are some options to run this unconditionally. Um, but it, prior to NonMem7, it, it did require a successful minimization. You might want to um, hold the covariance step off until you've achieved a model that uh, uh, that you're happy with, um, with the goodness of fit and so on, because the covariance step itself can be computationally expensive. And sometimes if, if it's a difficult uh, covariance matrix, uh, meaning a not so well-defined model, it may take quite a while to run. So you really only want to run this after you've defined a, um, a global minimum, you, you've, you've checked that uh, your diagnostic plots look good, and, uh, and then you, from that point you, you could run it as a second step using the, the model specification file as an input file. Okay. Once you get that output, you'll, you'll see that there's another section in the output called uh, standard errors of the estimates. And um, there are some ways, some useful ways to represent those. The standard error by itself is not very useful. It doesn't mean too much. It's only useful when we look at it in relative terms to the point estimate. So one way we could we could look at this is to calculate a percent relative standard error, uh, sometimes known as a percent CV. I hesitate to use that because we talked about the percent CV for inter-individual and residual variability. So let's call it a percent RSE. We have a standard error divided by the point estimate. So it's the relative size times 100. So this gives you some idea. You know, and usually for fixed effects parameters, if we're in the range of 10 to 20 percent uh, uh, relative standard error, that's very good. When you start getting to larger uh, percent relative standard errors, that, that, that indicates that the parameter is not well defined. And you'll see, for, for example, for the variance terms in a mixed effects model, uh, those are, are quite often less well defined than the fixed effects. You can calculate an approximate, and I say approximate here, um, symmetric confidence interval um, from the standard error. And this is just based on an assumption that um, the estimation error is symmetric and it's actually normal around the um, point estimate. Uh, and so what we're saying here is that if a 95% interval is about 1.96 times the standard error, uh, plus or minus. Um, this is not always reliable uh, as a true confidence interval, but it's, it's a shortcut and sometimes useful. In a linear mixed effects model, it's quite reliable. And for, um, for fixed effects parameters in, in some nonlinear models, it's also uh, reasonable. The variance parameters, it's not, uh, it's not accurate because, of course, you can't have a symmetric um, imprecision around a variance term. It can't be negative as well as, um, as some highly nonlinear uh, models. But you'll see this, this calculated sometimes, and this you would call it, uh, an approximate um, symmetric 95% confidence interval based on the asymptotic standard errors. In the model evaluation lecture, we'll talk about other methods for getting this standard error, including bootstrapping and likelihood profiling. OK. I'm going to pause now, and we're going to go look at some examples. Um, the next section here deals with PREDPP, which we're, we're going to really um, cover next week. Uh, so what I want to do is to go into um, some of the problems. And I'm going to scroll down to the practice problems. I've got three practice problems for you this week. And we'll use one or two of them as demos today. We'll see how far we get. I'd like to get the first two done. And then the third one you're going to do for homework. The first here is a, is a population uh, PK model. Actually, we're using a population PK method, um, but it's just in vitro uh, enzyme kinetic data. And we're, we've got a hypothetical experiment in, in uh, 20 different liver slice samples where we're estimating Vmax and KM for a particular enzyme system. This is a fixed design and, and eval evaluates the activity at, at fixed concentrations uh, of the uh, substrate um, from 0.1 to 1,000 micromolar. 
and I've got a data set for you in the examples folder. So I'm going to show you here how to get started. We're going to load this up on the Simi server. We're going to view the data in R, and I'll show you how to use Simi to, to do that. We'll edit the control stream. We'll, we'll run on them using the MI funds package. Uh, and, uh, and, and that'll be the same uh, sequence of events that we do for all of these examples. Problem two um, and problem three are, are problems that uh, you're going to be familiar with. These are the data sets that we looked at in a naive pooled approach using the nonlinear regression spreadsheet. Remember our hypothetical drug development example we have going in the background here? We've got uh, a phase one study with QT data. Well, we're going to analyze those data now with, um, with a nonlinear mixed effects approach using non-MEM. It's the same data set. Remember, one of them is a QT uh, prolongation data set. The other one is uh, an AST elevation. And so we want to develop a structural model for those, estimate population parameters and individual parameters. And then I've asked a question, what's the expected value of the QT prolongation at, at specific concentrations? So the data sets are provided again for you, and I have actually given you um, templates for both of these. What I'd like you to do, though, um, Problem three is going to be your homework problem, which is the AST model. I'd like you to start from scratch on that one and not use the uh, the uh, templates or the the, the um, example that I've given you. So um, let's go to Simi here, and we'll start with the first problem, and, and I'll go through the whole process to show you how to load this up, how to set things up, and uh, and then we'll work through, and, and we'll also look at all of the output and results and discuss how you know all of these things we just talked about, how you can do that in, in the real world and, and, and where you read that. So let's, um, let's pause here. I'm just gonna, before I jump in here, I'm just gonna look at the question board. Okay, uh, question about dollar sim. We'll, we'll cover dollar sim later in the course. Um, the syntax of dollar cove, is it similar to dollar theta? No, dollar cove doesn't have much of a syntax, in fact, uh, you don't have to use any syntax. Let's let's look at the help file. We'll look at dollar cove. If we look, dollar cove is actually just uh, can be specified as a single block, just dollar cove. It will initiate the covariance step, but you can also ask for a particular structure of that matrix. You can ask for the eigenvalues to be printed and so on. So we're going to scroll down here till we see covariance, dollar cove, dollar covariance. And you'll see that you can use it just uh, on its own, dollar covariance, or you can specify the matrix uh, to be different from the default, which is inverse R times S times inverse R. Matrix R um, uses uh, just the, the R matrix, two times the R matrix, can be useful sometimes uh, if you're having difficulty with inverting that matrix. Um, you know, there, there are different softwares use different ones as default. Um, this is, um, I believe this is called the sandwich uh, method, um, which, is, which is being used here as the default in non but you can override that. You can also ask to print out um, the eigenvalues of the correlation matrix. Um, you can print out uh, other components as well. Um, conditional or unconditional. This is new with non-MEM7. So uh, conditional is the, is the default where, where the covariance step is only going to run when estimation terminates successfully. But you could also try to run it when the estimation step can, terminates uh, uh, unsuccessfully. So, anyway, there. Look at the help file for more on that one. There. That's. But usually, we'll just implement as just dollar covariance. Okay. I think that covers the questions. So let's go back to the course site here, and I'll show you how you could get started. So, if we go to today's lecture. There's a file here called examples. 
I click on that and it's going to automatically download that okay and I'll look at that in my downloads folder and um, I made a copy I already got it there called example.zip this is the file so this is the file we're going to want to upload to Simi so you start up Simi and let me increase the screen size you start up Simi you go to your home page oh I gotta reload sorry about that You go to your home page, and uh, I have a few directories here that you're not going to have. You're, you're going to have to create the structure, and you can place it any place you'd like. I'd suggest that we do it in something like this, mi210w, and if that directory is not there, you can create a directory by simply typing in, for example, we type in something test directory. That's going to be a directory if we click on create directory. You'll see that's here now, test directory. Well, anyway, I've created one called mi210w. And then there's another one in there for this topic, which is called end pop models. Uh, it's defined in the handout, um, end pop models. So I want to create that one. And now I want to upload that uh, enzyme kinetics example here, uh, or all of those examples. So what I'm going to do here is choose a file to upload and it's right here example.zip and you just upload it as a zip file you don't have to uh, extract this so you choose that and choose upload and so now there we go it's, it's uploaded to my home folder on simi and here's the structure it's under users mark g mi 210w in pop models example since this is a zip file the utility here allows you to unpack it so you click unpack and now we have a folder called example and you can denote folders here in this browser folders are in square brackets the dot dot allows you to go up folder but what we want to do is descend into here now the example folder and you see I've got three different examples AST QT those are the problems two and three and the enzyme kinetics one which is problem one we're going to work with enzyme kinetics so we'll open that folder okay now I'm not asking you to fall to try to implement this as we're talking right now I'd, I'd prefer that you just watch uh, and in fact I might even add some comments and, and, and answer questions in the code here and I'll post a new version after we finish class but um, pay attention to how we're doing this you can come back to the recordings if you're not clear on how to operate uh, we're going to move ahead now with the enzyme uh, kinetics data set and here it is it's called ens.csv and uh, we could download that to look at it. I can also look at it as a text file I'm just gonna hit control and ends and you'll see here it's a comma separated file it has a comment column and has an ID column it has a concentration and activity and a missing dependent variable column. Concentration and activity here are the, the predictive variable, concentration, and the dependent variable, activity. Okay, so it's your, your basic setup. Everything here for, for this is present on each line. So we have ID 1, concentration 0 0.1, activity 0 0.15. Same slice, same experiment at this concentration, and so on, and then at the next concentration. And so you see here, it's, it's your typical um, dollar pred and I'm trying data setup. Back to Simi. That's the data set. Well, I've got you started here with an R uh, script, and this is how we're going to run all of our models. And, and you can reuse this and use the ones in the examples. I would like you to focus on writing your own control streams when you do the homework problem but uh, the R script here is called ends.r uh, we can edit that and again if you hit the the control key or command if you're on a Mac uh, edit you'll see that it opens a new window I'll expand that again 
And then the other thing we're going to want to do, I'm going to go back to Simi, and I'm going to do the same thing. I'm going to open an R window. See this R up here? This is just the R console. Great. So the way that this works is very similar to the R interface if you're used to using R or S+, is that we have a script window and we have an output window. I'm going to start in the script window. And um, this is not an R class, so I'm going to script everything up for you uh, that you need and give you examples that you can modify. However, if you are comfortable with R, if you've taken the R for pharmacometrics class that we offer, then by all means, you know, don't, don't be constrained to the code that I'm writing here. This is our first problem. So we're going to start off by just clearing the environment and loading some libraries. I'm going to set working example in fact I'm going to change this here so it's mark G uh, actually end pop models okay and if I'm not sure what that is I can go back to the simi homepage you see right down here users mark G mi 210w end pop models example okay so that's where I'm working I'm going to set that now and we'll just leave it there and then this command here that we're using, this is specific to the implementation. This is the non-mem command for the version of non-mem that we're using. Um, we're using non-mem 7 um, compiled with the, the Intel Fortran compiler on Macintosh OS X. Uh, that's what our server here uses, and then that's what you'll be using. Just, just to replicate this because the way that our scripts are set up is we can use different installations of non-mem if you'd like, um, but we're going to use this one for this course. So all of this stuff up here is is pretty much boilerplate, um, except you're going to want to modify to reflect your own directory structure. You know, you can keep it pretty close to what I've got here. You just you just change your own username. Um, that'll make it easiest. But really, you can set it any place you'd like. Okay, so we're going to run this. If you make a change, for example, you can save it. It saves the text file. Um, but then we're going to run it by selecting, and the comments don't have to be selected, but by selecting with your mouse the lines you want to run. And then we just click Evaluate. Okay, it looks like nothing happened, but that's because the console is on the next tab. We'll look over here. If you go to the console, you'll see here that it, that it loaded the libraries. And you don't have to worry about these. They're all um, at system level libraries. You don't have to do any library installations. You just need to load them. Um, we're loading uh, Lattice, which is a plotting function, Mass, which is also part of that, a couple others, Reshape and Plier here, which are used for data uh, manipulation, and as well as MI Funds. MI Funds is the uh, Metro Institute functions for uh, facilitating pharmacometric type analyses. Okay, so we've done that part, no errors, that's fine. So we went down here. Now, next we're going to import the data set. And I'm using the read CSV, remember it's a CSV text file. I'm reading the read CSV uh, command to, to load this into a data frame called ends.data. Okay. And um, go back to R here, you can see it's been loaded. If you wanted to see what was in there, we could type, let's do this, we'll use the head command, ends.data. And those are the first few rows of that data set. Okay, great. So if you're familiar with R, you'll, you'll find this is very similar to, to in R console and in R script window. Next, we're going to move on to um, creating some graphs. And uh, first I start off here by just creating a PDF file that we're going to dump these graphics into. I'm going to plot concentration versus activity. And then I'm also going to plot what we call an index plot, where we plot uh, uh, different items versus um, the dependent variable. And, and since this data set has, I'm, I'm going to actually add another one here. We'll do um, index plots for each element in the data set. So I'm just going to copy this, actually. Our data set contains uh, a few elements. 
we go back here, you'll see we have ID, concentration, observed activity, and MDV. So I'm going to plot concentration and observed activity versus ID. Those are so-called index plots. Just change the name of the variable here. And then I'm going to turn off the plot. So let's run that. This is creating a few graphics. Evaluate. Go back to our console. Okay, no problem. Device off. So if we go back to our home page now, you'll see there's a plot here called exploratory. And let's look at the plots. Let's see, make this a little bit smaller. So first is the activity versus concentration. And what we can see from this um, right away is we get a good idea of the relationship. This uh, looks like a saturable response. We can see pretty quickly that there's some large variability, especially at the higher end, so maybe a proportional variability. We have a maximum effect that's plateauing out here, somewhere in the range of between 100 and 150. Um, if we had to estimate what, uh, if that's our Vmax, what our KM would be, uh, it's probably something that gives us half maximal, so uh, maybe drop a vertical around here. It's, it's going to be somewhere in the neighborhood of, uh, of 100 or, or less on the concentration unit scale. So we've got some ideas there for initial estimates and, and the shape of the model already just by looking at this plot. We also see here that um, there's at one point way out here. It seems a little bit odd, but at about 2,000 concentration units, we've got a measured activity. Okay. Well, that, when we do this sort of exploratory plot, we, we're looking for data errors and outliers. So that might be one thing to concern, concern ourselves with. When we look at the index plot, it becomes quite evident. When we plot the concentration versus ID, Remember, this was a fixed design, so every experiment had the same range of concentrations. And that seems to be the case here. We have concentrations at the same values across all the IDs, except for this one up here. And this one uh, seems to be associated with that concentration of 2,000 uh, micromolar. Whereas, remember, our, our experimental design said 1,000 was the maximum. Uh, and it looks like it's ID number 10. You can line it right up here, ID number 10. So there might be a data error there. When we look at um, the activity versus enzyme I, versus uh, ID, uh, you see a range of activities, but they're all within the same cloud. No obvious outliers there. So these are some useful plots. They're called index plots. They're useful plots for quickly defining outliers. Let's go back to the script. So I've already made some comments here. After viewing the plots, one data entry error was identified for subject 10. Concentration was 2,000 instead of 1,000. And so we identify that as a data entry error. Now we're going to correct it. We're just going to assign that value of 1,000 to that point. We'll make a data correction. And then what we'll do is we'll write out that to a new file, which we're going to call ENDS3.csv. This is going to be a corrected data file. So here's, here's a nice uh, data management uh, step in R and we're creating an audit trail of your data corrections as well. So that was written to a file, no problems. Go back to the script. Okay. So my next instructions are to edit the control stream 1.ctl. The reason we're going to edit that is that we've defined now a model structure. We have some idea of the of the initial estimates. Let's, let's create something that, that matches. So we go back to the home directory. Here's 1.ctl. I've given you a starting point. Uh, we can edit that file. And this looks very similar to the one we discussed in class. We have an enzyme kinetics estimation. This is a problem statement, totally arbitrary. Remember, we have the columns indicated here. In fact, event ID doesn't really um, uh, mean anything to dollar preg. We're using it later for, for plotting purposes, potentially. Um, 
but we have co the comment column, we have the ID indicator, we have concentration, and we have DV. Remember, these names here are not the same, same as the label as, the, uh, as was used in the data set itself, but that's okay. These are the names that are actually going to be recognized. In fact, that row is commented out in the data set. Um, and so really, it's up to the input statement to define the names of the columns. Then we define the data set. It's the corrected one we just made, ends3.csv. And we're going to ignore anything that begins with a C. We're going to find the model now in $pred. And this is a, a model that's similar to the uh, Emacs model we looked at in the handouts before. We have a KM defined with a fixed effect and an inter-individual random effect. We have a Vmax, again, with a fixed and random effect. And activity now is, is Vmax times concentration divided by KM plus concentration. I haven't included a, um, a cooperativity parameter, a hill coefficient here, uh, but uh, we're assuming that it's one. Um, and then, so our, our data y are equal to the prediction activity plus a residual error. And we'll also include ipred equals y so we can get individual parameters out of this. Okay, great. That's the model. Let's see, any questions on that model? Let me check the discussion board. Okay, yeah, there's a question here about um, instead of correcting that data, could we have changed, should we just comment it out? And we certainly could have done that. What we would do in that case is, is set the value of C in that, in that first column of the data set for the particular row, we would comment it out by, by setting the, the value of C equal to C. Remember, it's ignore equal C. Um, so we'd, we'd, we'd specify a C in that column. Okay, so I'm just going to step back and show you where that was done. We did this data correction here. This line uh, was the correction. And what we did is we corrected the data point. Instead, what we could have done is commented out the... Um, let me show you. We could have commented out the data record in question. And I'm going to just leave this as a comment. I'm not going to run this, but uh, the way you do that is, is end data dollar C, it's the C column where concentration is 1,000, we would insert then a character string of C. That would now give us a data set with one less record. Uh, it's a commented out record, and we could run that through and, and, and just uh, remove the outlier. Still keeping it in the data set, but it's not going to be passed forward to non -mem. Okay, let's go back. So. We're going to, instead, we corrected the data. We're going to run with the full data set. We define the model here. Um, remember when we looked at the graphics, we, I said you know that uh, KM is somewhere below 100. And uh, I'm, I'm guessing 20 here. Let's, let's maybe we'll, we'll say it's 50 just from the graphics. And then the VMAX, yeah, it looked like it was 100, 120, something like that. That's probably reasonable. We're specifying inter-individual variance terms now. Look for omega here, omega 1 and 2. These are the diagonals associated with eta 1 and eta 2. So this first one is the, is the variance of, omega, of eta 1. The variance of eta 1. And the second one here is the variance of eta 2. Well, Unless we really know what, what the magnitude of that inter-individual variability is, we might just come up with a guess. And by putting a variance of 0.04, square root of that gives us 0.2 times 100 is a 20% inter-individual coefficient of variation. So we could say approximately 20% CV. Now, sigma, I'm not sure what we, what we have for an estimate there, too, but Sigma in our model now is a variance of this additive residual error, epsilon 1. Of eps 1. 
and uh, the variance is, is 10, the square root is going to be somewhere around 3. Right? So the standard deviation is around 3. We can run max of L, and in this case we'll run um, we'll run the whole thing here with method 0. That's, that's the uh, method 0 is the first order method. We're going to run the post hoc step. And um, we're going to create a model specification file. I'm also going to run the covariance step here so we get standard errors for this model. I know this is a quick run. Uh, I don't mind paying the computational price now to do that. And then the table file is going to be, we're not going to print it to the, to the output. We're going to instead create a new file, one header. It's going to a table called one.tab. And it's going to include ID, concentration, KM, VMAX, activity, IPRED, event ID, and then whatever else we want to add to this. Um, we'll leave it at this for now. You'll get the automatic um, appending of uh, DV pred residuals and weighted residuals that's, that's added to every table unless you request not to do that. So I'm going to save that. Okay, good time for questions. Oh, it looks like a lot here. Um, should we use IPRED equals activity but not Y? Actually, either would work. So we could do it this way, or we could say IPRED equals activity. Either, either one would work. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I guess a couple of folks picked up on that one. It's 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 um, really what we want to capture in the IPRED is everything that contains the inter-individual random effects. So whether we use activity or Y, if you follow the definitions here, uh, everything that's that's present in Y. Uh, Include all. Um, excuse me. All of the inter-individual random effects are captured in activity, and therefore they're also captured in Y. See, the eta one is in KM, and eta two is in Vmax. You plug that all in, you get activity, and that's that's the individual random effect that we need for the individual prediction. So we could use activity. We could use Y. Um, we don't really care to capture epsilon. All we want to do is capture the individual individual random effects. So either would work here. This is an old habit because in earlier versions of non-mem, uh, ipred equals y was was not allowed. Um, but uh, either either way would work. Okay, so we'll save that. Now we're ready to run. We'll go back to our R script. We're doing everything from R now. Um, so it's useful when you're doing this to insert some comments along the way. We're at this point. Edit the control stream. So now we're going to run non-mem, and we're going to run non-mem with this simple command called non-r, you know, running non-mem from r. Um, this is the most basic syntax here we can use. Uh, one is the name of the control stream. We use numbers to reflect all of the control streams, uh, and then one that assumes an extension of .ctl. So one.ctl is the control stream. We just need to specify that as one. Now you could set a, a vector here if you want to run a batch. You know, if you had 100 models, you could write 1 colon 100. Um, but we just have a single run we're going to do. The non-mem command is already defined in something called command. Remember above here, we set the command to this function. So that's what command does for us. Grid equals true allows us to use um, the distributed computing mechanism we have set up on this server. We have it set up with Sun Grid Engine. And uh, you don't have to use that, but um, I, I would ask you all to do so because that allows us to load balance better if we have multiple users um, accessing this server here. So use grid equals true. That means it will be run in a distributed computing environment. All that means is that each individual's run gets queued up uh, and, and ordered um, in, in order in which they were launched, and, and it's managed using um, the grid computing environment. Uh, and we're not going to run diag equals false. We have some standard diagnostic plots that we'll run later in the class, but we're going to create our own instead, so I'm, I'm turning that off for now. 
Um, if you're interested and you want, and want to learn more about MI Funds, you, there's a help for MI Funds up here. If you look at this, help for non-MR and MI Funds, I'm just going to hit Control MI Funds help. Oh, it didn't link to MI Funds. I'm sorry about that. Let me go back. Well, I thought that was fixed. That's still not linking us to uh, to NM funds. Let's look at the packages we've got here in R. Yeah, here it is. So um, let me show you how to get there. And I'll make sure we fix that right after class here. If you go back to your home page, um, instead of clicking MI funds, you can get there through R. So pick the R help. And then you choose packages. MI funds is an R package. And then these are all packages that, that are loaded here. We can pick MI funds. And this gives us now the help access for all of the packages. So we can click on the main page. Oh, sorry about that. We can pick on um, a particular func function call. So for example, the function we're using now is called non R. Here's MI funds. Well, There, I guess that uh, that's what happens when you demo live. It was working before, so we'll we'll see what's happening here. The help file is down now, um, but I'll make sure that gets fixed. For your own use in this particular problem, just stick to the syntax that I'm using here. Um, so, C M I funds help later. Sorry about that. Um, but the syntax is just the run number, command, grid equals true, and diag equals false. So let's run it. You just highlight that row, click evaluate, and look at the R console. And you can see the job's been submitted to the queue. And uh, you'll see this might be a little confusing to you. You see one, run 1C one and run 1E. E. Uh, that's because we've divided this up into two steps. First is the comp compilation step. Uh, these models are all compiled with Fortran compiler uh, at runtime. And so the first part is to compile. And then the second part is to execute that compiled code. There are some advantages for doing that in a multi-user distributed com environment where um, especially if you're using a com commercial compiler, you may not need to purchase the commercial compiler for all of the compute nodes. You just send them off to be compiled and then you execute them. So that's done automatically here by the non R command with MI funds. We run it and it's completed. So now let's look at what happened to the output. Well, first let's look at what we get here. We have, um, a folder that's created and it's named by the run number so there's a folder called one and in that folder there's a bunch of output and there's a control file uh, this extra file which has which has some some interesting pieces we'll look at uh, and the list file the list file is the one we'll start with might be a little too big huh Okay, so here's the list file. This is actually run using our NMQual system, so it's, it tags and, and uh, labels all these things according to run times. Uh, in, it's, can help uh, if you're setting up a qualified environment. But what we've got is the control stream at the top, everything that we just specified. Then we have the output. And of course now, <laughs> non has its uh, has its own uh, license and expiration date. You're going to be reminded of that every time you run it. This is non -MEM 7 version 1, uh, 1.2. I'm sorry, version 7.12. Um, so he tells you a, a little bit about the history there of non -MEM. Problem statement, where the data set is. Uh, number of data records, we had 180 rows, five data items, 
The ID is item two, dependent variable is item four. And these are the labels. So it's basically spitting that back to us for what we've asked for. These are all the predefined items. How many records, how many individuals. Okay, how long was theta? So how many fixed effects parameters? Um, omega, the simple diagonal. Uh, we have um, initial estimates of theta here. Lower bound and upper bound are set. Well, there was a zero lower bound. The upper bound is just set to some huge number, um, indicating no no upper bound. Here's the initial estimate of omega, initial estimate of sigma. So in any, in any case, what I'm showing you here is that everything that we've asked the, the software to do gets re repeated to us in the output. It's a good place to check just in case um, you have some odd results and you think that, that something might have gone awry. Estimation step was not omitted. We did estimation. We didn't do epsilon interaction because we have an additive error now. Um, post hoc, yes, we're going to run post hoc. Uh, MSF file, yes. Uh, so again, all, all the kind of stuff that we asked for. What is going to be included in our table? This is what we asked for in our table. And then in our um, residuals here, it's telling us that the pred is going to be n pred. Well, remember in the table help file I showed you, that's the prediction that we get under the FO assumption. Non-conditional estimation, no interaction. And then residuals is the residuals under non-conditional estimation. And the weight residuals is the weight residuals under non-conditional estimation. And, and that's fine because we use the first order method. Now we get through the monitoring of search and you see, it reminds us we did a first order method. At the zeroth iteration, we have an initial objective function value of 2,596. That's the objective function calculated at the initial estimates. And um, the parameters here are all scaled to value of 0.1. The parameters are always rescaled in non-mem during the search. And the gradients are represented here. These are the gradients of each parameter. So this is the first. And the order here is always theta, omega, sigma. So this is theta 1, theta 2, omega 1, 1, omega 2, 2, and sigma 1, 1. We have 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 estimated parameters in this model at the population level. The gradients, well, the iterations are printed every 10 because that's what we asked for. And we see here that the gradients start out at 5 times 10 to the first, 10 to the first, 10 to the first, and 10 to the third. And the next, <clears throat> after 10 iterations, those gradients have gotten smaller. See now it's 10 to the 0, minus 2, minus 1, minus 1, so they're getting smaller. And then even smaller at the last iteration. And that's what we want to see. We want to see these gradients go from something that might be steep to more shallow. It's really the absolute value of the gradient that we care about. And that's a, an important thing to look at here, is that the gradients are continuously decreasing, becoming more shallow, that they're not bouncing around from a small number to a large number back to a small number. Um, that's indicative. If that happens, that's indicative of a poorly defined minimum. Tells us how, many time, how much time the run took. Minimization was successful. We got a parameter estimate near its boundary. It's just a, uh, a warning there. And um, this has to be addressed before the covariance can be implemented. Now that's because we asked for the conditional estimation of covariance. Okay. So that's fine. So first order minimum value of the objective function is 1,000. This is what we ended up with. We started with 2,596. So quite, quite a big drop from our initial estimates. But we still have some things to work out. Here's the final parameters. The way to view this then is it's 46 was uh, the KM and 105 is the VMAX. That's our population estimates. Ah, look at the next piece. This is the covariance matrix of the random effects. We see here that uh, the Variance on KM is being driven to a very small number, 10 to the minus 6. But the um, Emax variance is, is, is being estimated at a reasonable number. 
this is what was giving us that message that the parameter is near the boundary. It's not because we set a boundary in the search, but it's because the, the, the boundary, the lower bound for a variance term is zero. And uh, it looks like here we're approaching a, um, a very small variance. But let's, let's keep that in, in the back of our mind. We'll look at some plots and, and see if that makes sense afterwards. Covariance uh, matrix for the random effects. Well, we just have a single variance term, and that's sigma. Uh, looks pretty large. Okay, that's an additive error of 137. Um, you know, so square root about 10 on the whatever the whatever the response unit scale is here. All right, so the rest of this stuff is just all tracking the the environment. That's not relevant to the non-MEM output. It's really more for qualification of the installation. Um, it's not part of the standard non-MEM output either. That's, this is all, everything here from uh, the dotted line down is, is related to uh, the NMQAL mediated run. All right, so that's our output. Let's go back to the console here. You can see, if you're interested, you can look at this EXT file, this is sort of the extra stuff. Um, I'll open it in another window. And this shows us here, it's just a summary of the monitoring of search, the value of the parameter rescaled back at each iteration, and then the objective function at each iteration. Okay. Um, let's look at some plots now. So we looked at the run. The run converged. We ended up with a, a failed covari covariance step, um, but we think we know why. And uh, so now we'll do some plots. I'll do these plots and then I'll come in and answer some questions. But um, what we're going to do first is then we're going to pull in the table file we created. The table file here, you'd have to edit this if you change the number, but it's one.tab. We name that in the control stream. And the next part here is we're just going to subset anything where weighted residuals equal to zero. Those are records that are, are reflecting no data. So uh, we, we only want to be plotting diagnostics here for the um, records that include data. Dosing records, for example, will be excluded. We'll open a new PDF file called Diagnostics, and uh, we're going to set up the layout here. We're just going to do a one by one uh, for this. Um, we could do a two by two. Let's see how many plots we have. Yeah, let's do a two by two. This is just a layout settings, and um, I'm going to run this whole block of plots down to the device off. Uh, what happens here is we start the PDF device. This is the file we're gonna dump all of this to. And when we turn it off, that's when it gets printed to the file. We're gonna create plots here for um, the typical diagnostics. Um, I'm not gonna bother too much with the code. Let's just go to the plots and we can discuss it after that. So I just ran it. Let's see what happens. Looks like it ran. We'll go to the simi output. Remember, we're down a directory now. We're in the directory for the run one. We need to go up a directory to the parent, and we want diagnostics.pdf. So this is set up on multiple pages. Um, some of these are, are um, nice to view on the same page, some, some not so. Much, but here's here's the um, enzyme activity versus concentration. I'll blow this one up a little bit. This is the predicted line. The, so there are some points here at the inflection. The prediction through the observed data, and you see that the, the the prediction does a pretty good job of capturing the data right through the middle. Not bad, not bad. When we look at um, the next couple of plots, here we have the observed data versus prediction and the observed data versus the individual prediction. The population prediction is calculated on the left-hand side with A to equal to zero. The 
prediction on the right hand side is eight at the individual estimate and you see that you know one thing you'll notice is that the, the data are pretty well balanced across the unit line um, the individualized plot looks a little bit better um, but both of them are decent but we can also pick up something else here too which is the pattern of the variability in the data see it's kind of small at the low end and gets larger at the high end same thing happens on the right hand side And you see it here in the residuals versus pred plot. Remember, this plot tells us about the nature of the variability data. We see a clear proportional variability. Okay, great. What did we model, though? Did we model a proportional variability? No, we didn't. We modeled this as an additive. So we've come up with a couple of things there that, that might be problematic. Um, one is that we have a um, a proportional variability in the data, but we've modeled it in an additive term. And then the second is that it appears we have a, a strong uh, uh, indication that the random effect on KM is, is difficult to estimate. It's approaching zero. You know, there's one more plot that we should create, and I'm, I'm going to go back and do that in the batch. And that is a plot of the, um, I'm going to switch this back to large scale again. I'm going to make a plot of the individual eta scatter. And you can just use this. Uh, but we didn't include the etas in our table file, did we? We'll have to go back and rerun that. Let me do that right now. A1, sorry, A2. We'll save that. That's the only change I'm going to make right now. Um, we'll go back to this and I'll run non mem. It's been submitted, okay. And we're just going to change the plots a little bit here because I want to add one more plot. And that's this one here. It's going to be eta 1 versus eta put a smooth through that just like the other plots okay save that so now let's run since we've run them and let's uh, import the data I'm sorry import the table file and create the plots oh sometimes <laughs> I ran something here that was not commented out. Sorry about that. Let's just run this piece. One thing is that we that we do observe sometimes is with the semi interface. If you try to execute too many lines of code at once, you'll end up with uh, a reading error. So this looks okay. Let's go back to the output now and look at diagnostics. Uh, 
hasn't completed. There we go. So again, same goodness of fit we saw there. What I did create is this A to 1, A to 2 scatter plot. We have a small number of individuals here, but uh, you see kind of a strong correlation between the two. Uh, and the A to 1 on this very small, um, very small value indicating that it's not well defined, it's approaching zero. So there's a couple of things we want to do to improve this model that we just learned from the diagnostics. I'm going to comment them into the script here. Um, we've observed eta 1 variance approaching 0. And heteroscedastic pattern in the data. Residual variance. So our fix for this then, our fix for this is to, um, well, tell you what, I'm going to change our assignment tonight since we're running out of time. And I'm going to give you this to fix. What we're going to need to do then is, is adjust the eta variance or eliminate that element of omega um, and then try a different residual variance model. So you can use this as a template and make those changes, create a new control stream, and we'll run through this solution on Friday as well as solutions for the other two pieces. Um, so I'm going to post this up uh, after the class with the comments included. I'd like you to, um, to fix this model uh, for Friday. And then um, if, you, if you're brave and you're doing well, go on and try problems two and three. We'll run through them on Friday, but if you want to try them on your own, please go ahead and do that too. So I'm going to save this one here. And I'm going to share back this, this code with you with the annotated control stream. Okay, so before we break today, I just want to re review any last questions. Uh, how can we run non-mem from R? Oh, sorry. Yeah, that's, so that's the MI funds package that we're using to run non-mem from R. Um, gradient zero is allowed. Gradient zero is, is not allowed. It's zero gradient is, is, is problematic. Um, you, now, you may from time to time have a starting gradient of zero or an ending gradient of zero, um, but throughout the process, you, you, you don't want to see a zero gradient. What that means is that the... Um, parameter is not influencing the prediction. And particularly if you have a zero gradient from start through finish, that's extremely problematic. It tells you that the, that parameter has never even played a role in, 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 in impacting the prediction. So zero gradients are not good. What else? Uh, other questions here? Okay. Review the question of, on the midterm. Um, okay, these two other questions I'm going to respond through the um, through the web interface. One of them is about a question on the midterm. The other one is about textbooks. Um, we'll hold those for the uh, we'll hold those for the website, but. I do want to make sure that, uh, that everybody's clear on what we've done here. So I'm going to hold on just for a few more minutes. Any questions on what we've just done with this enzyme kinetics model? And uh, your, your job is going to be to extend this and uh, to give it a shot at, at modeling the other two um, examples too. Any questions? Okay, well, as usual, I'm available during the week through the website, um, so let me know if we need to uh, clarify anything. And we'll pick this up on Friday at lab session 
um, and we'll, we'll, review, we'll review this example as well as the other two problems. Thanks for your attention. We're out of time for today, and we'll talk more on Friday.